Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Alzoni. I'm from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. I have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Edward Glazer. Uh, before I start with the introduction, I would like to inform that this is a, this is a webinar. You will be able to pose your questions on the chat, not in uh, orally. Uh, I will try to keep the, the time after this short introduction. We will have the 35 minute uh, lecture by Professor Glazer, and then Professor Andrea Calario, Calario will make his comments. And if we have time, then we'll be able to take questions from the floor. I'll be coordinating this. So it's an honor to have Professor Glazer with us today. Professor Glazer had his under, undergraduate studies in economics at Princeton University, where he graduated cum laude. He's, he received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1992, and right after, he started uh, teaching at Harvard. He's presently the Fred and Eleanor Glynn Professor of Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. He teaches microeconomics theory in urban and public economics. He allies sound technical and analytical skills with communication abilities that make reading his works enjoyable while preserving the analytical rigor. Most scholars concentrate on technical papers published in prestigious journals and Professor Glazer does that extensively. To cite only one impact, impacting technical work, I would like to point to his 1997 paper with uh, Professor Ellison. Uh, the authors provide a richer indicator of concentration with a solid analytical background. And this new indicator became a benchmark for concentration studies since then. However, many scholars can, not many scholars can translate the arid technical language of ours in publications reaching a large audience. The best example is Professor Glazer's 2011 book, The Triumph of the City which has inspired many academic papers and influenced urban policy worldwide. In the last month, the world is facing a huge challenge. Having our World Congress online is a small testament to this situation. And cities are the main battleground of the new social and economic reality as a large and growing share of population is living in cities. This new situation poses new challenges to the cities. And we are all eager to understand the changes and mostly find solutions to the resulting problems. We are looking forward to Professor Glass's presentation on the survival of the city. Professor Glaser, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you for including me in this. Um, it is such a shame that we can't all be together. I've been so looking forward to being in Marrakesh, um, but at least we can connect virtually. Uh, but as, as we know, it is no substitute for being live and, and in person, either in a conference or in a city. Um, so if I had been giving this talk two years ago, uh, and I'm sure that in fact, I have shown these slides to uh, RSAI meetings in the past. I, I would have started with something like this, um, something where we uh, note the remarkable correlation between urban density and uh, both income as measured by GDP per capita across the EU and population change here between 2000 and 2010, which is indicative of the strength of cities in uh, the modern world which is indicative of the fact that cities are places not just of enormous productivity, but of pleasure. And that whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the Eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, 
at the start of the 21st century, we were at least uh, clustering in instead of, crowd, instead of spreading out. Um, and I might have mentioned uh, a graph like this one, which shows urban and rural happiness around the world. Uh, if the dots are positive, that means that the urban dwellers, the city people are happier than the rural dwellers. If they're negative, it means the opposite. Um, as you can see, the wealthier countries, which are those over on the right, uh, are really a mixed bag. Some countries like Italy and New Zealand, the people who live in low density areas are happier. Some, some areas like Sweden, uh, the people who live in urban areas are happier. But if you go down to the poorest countries in the world, India, Ghana, Moldova, Mali, Rwanda, in these places, there is a huge happiness gap and it favors cities. And it reminds us that as difficult as life in an Indian slum may be, in that slum, there is still hope. In that slum, there's still possibility, but there's no future in rural poverty. And as difficult as uh, slum life may be, we should never think that we want to eliminate those slums. We should think that what we want to do is, is enable them to, them to grow and change and become healthier, to battle with the demons that come with density, uh, not to somehow or other constrain the urbanization of these countries in, in some way. Um, and of course, uh, I might have mentioned something like this. This is, uh, reminds us that cities are not just uh, places where we come to be productive, but places where we come to find joy. Uh, the downside, of course, of urban attractiveness is that in places where housing is constrained, as in, for example, central London, uh, this combination of demand to be there both for work and for play pushes prices up to an extraordinary degree. And that's what you see in this map of London, a uh, map of the UK over there. Um, but that would have all been very 2019, because in the past year, we have been reminded of the most terrible of the demons that come with density, of contagious disease. And contagious disease and urban life are old companions. The first well-documented urban plague we have is the plague of Athens. And this painting is often used uh, to connote that. Uh, this is actually a painting by the French Baroque artist Nicolas, Nicolas Poussin of a biblical plague. And it is indeed possible that the biblical plagues like the plague in the Iliad uh, point us to an earlier pandemic which brought down the Bronze Age civilizations and enable the conquest of the sea peoples. But this one, the plague of Athens, we have page after page of description in Thucydides. And it's, it's I think, helpful to first pause and remind us uh, ourselves of just how special Athens in the fifth century was. This is a city that does everything that you could ask urban connection to do. It's a city that through connected brilliance uh, gives us the birth of philosophy, gives us the birth of, uh, architecture, gives us the birth of drama, gives us the birth of history itself, gives us democracy. All of these things are gifts of the city and they are particularly gifts of fifth century Athens. Of course, the city also gives us plague. It also gives us contagion. Um, let's remember the backstory for this. So uh, the year 431, 432 BCE, the conflict between Athens and Sparta is heating up. Um, Sparta is trying to, to derail the Delian League that uh, Athens leads, and Pericles is ready to fight. The Pericles' cunning plan is to summon the Athenians and their allies behind the walls of the city, trusting in those walls to keep out their Spartan enemies who can have the dominant force on land, and instead send out the Athenian navy, which is dominant at sea. Uh, the plan is militarily sound. The walls hold against the Spartan hoplites. The fleet can ravage the Peloponnesian coast. But what the walls cannot keep out is pandemic, which enters through the port of Piraeus and makes its way easily through, uh, through the walls. This reminds us of a central source of vulnerability for cities is they are the nodes on the lattice of global transport and travel. And consequently, they are almost always the ports of entry for new disease. Of course, there's a second vulnerability, which is the density of the city. So whereas Thucydides tells us the low density Spartan dwellings in the Peloponnese suffered not at all from the plague, Athens is ravaged. Perhaps a quarter of the city's population killed off within four years. Um, Thucydides believes that it came in from Ethiopia. Modern opinion tends to, tends to credit uh, Asia more for this uh, disaster. Um, Thucydides presents us with harrowing discussions of how the, the whole city's social life is torn apart, how people lived for today because they expected to see no tomorrow. And in some sense, the Athens, uh, the glory of Athens is dimmed forever. The city would soldier on for another 25 years fighting Sparta, but it would never be as brilliant again. 
it was in some sense uh, the end, the culmination of Athens's golden age as this disease uh, brought down the city. An even more devastating uh, urban plague arguably happened in 541 CE in Constantinople. Um, the backstory for that is that, of course, the weakened by the, the plague of Cyprian in, in the third century, the Roman Empire had started to fall apart, the Western Empire had fallen, but this you know, rump of the Eastern Empire had continued. And after the first wave of Ostrogothic and Visigothic conquerors, men like Thor Theodoric I, had died, the Emperor Justinian was poised to send forth his legions and reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world. His warlord Belisarius was succeeding marvelously in Northern Africa and, and Italy. And it really looked as if victory was within their, within their grasp and that the Dark Ages would be proved to be less than a century rather than a millennium. Yet at that moment, Yersinia Pestis, the Black Death, makes its first appearance on European shores. Uh, it enters into Constantinople, it ravages the city, uh, and it completely derails this attempt to, to reconquer. There are two centuries of Yersinia Pestis that follow. And in some sense, the, the millennium that follows um, is, is really the result of, of those plagues, or at least arguably it is, right? So plague does have the possibility to massively derail or not just urban success, but the, but the movement of the world. Now, for the past 650 years, uh, our, you know, our growth, our urbanization has been relatively pandemic proof. I will return to the Black Death's interestingly uh, salutary effect on urbanization uh, later, but let me start first with the pandemics that hit our cities in the 19th century. The early 19th century was a first large wave of globalization as clipper ships plied the Atlantic and then the Pacific, and plagues made their way across the oceans. In the early decades of the 19th century, and this figure shows the arc of death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. In the early 19th century, the great killer was yellow fever. Mosquito-borne disease comes out of Africa, works its way up through the Caribbean, and starts slaughtering the cities of the Eastern seaboard in the early decades of, of the 19th century. In 1817, cholera emerges out of the Ganges Delta, follows along with British troops, makes its way over land, through Russia to Europe, and eventually across the oceans to, um, to, to America. Now, these terrible killers and the death rates from cholera are massively higher than the death rates from COVID-19. So for example, in Paris in 1831, five times more people died of uh, cholera than, than did it of COVID in 2020. Um, and of course, Paris had a much smaller population at the time. Um, these massive killers uh, were, um, were fought, they, and they were fought primarily with extraordinary investments in urban health. Uh, you can see there in 1842, the Croton Aqueduct is opening. Um, these investments, clean water, sewers, were actually the result of a medical mistake. So there were two primary schools of thought in early 19th century medicine, one of which emphasized contagion, the spread of disease across people. And of course, cholera and yellow fever are in fact contagious diseases. They're just carried by, uh, carried in the water or carried by mosquitoes. But the other school emphasized miasma, the idea of foul airs rising out of swampy territory. The miasma theorists were somewhat dominant, perhaps because contagionists tended to think of, of disease passing from person to person directly, which of course these diseases don't. Um, so, the miasma theorists triumph and they decided they needed to drain the swamp. And that's what the Croton Aqueduct is about. That's what Central Park is about. Um, and not until 1854 does Dr. John Snow illustrate that cholera is actually waterborne. America's cities and towns are spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as our national government is spending on everything except for the post office and the army. Uh, extraordinary investments, and perhaps an indication of what we'll have to invest going forward to make sure that this pandemic is a one and uh, for all happening, the current one that we're experiencing. It's not just, of course, about investments in infrastructure, though. It's also about incentives. You may notice that the Croton Aqueduct opens in 1842, but there are still cholera outbreaks for 25 years afterwards. There's a, my great, great, great grandfather dies in the 1849 cholera epidemic here in New York City. Um, that's happening because New York City, like Sub-Saharan Africa today, has a last mile problem. They built this expensive system. They actually provided, uh, I think, 3,000 free hydrants, but 
New York City is big, water is heavy to carry, and poor people are not willing to pay for the connection. Consequently, they stick with their latrines, they stick with their shallow wells, and they continue to get cholera. It's not until 1866 when the Board of Health uh, comes along and starts producing incentives that go along with infrastructure that you actually don't, you're essentially forcing tenement owners or you're finding tenement owners who don't connect, and there you finally get the change. I think in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, we will also need to have various forms of incentives, either subsidies or, or penalties for property owners who don't connect to the water. But with those investments, cities became healthy. Um, with the exception of the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, which you can see here, uh, an aberration, um, we've now had a century of low health. For most of the past 20 years, life expectancies have been significantly longer in New York City than they are outside the US. And it seemed as if you know, the danger of pandemic, the danger of contagion was gone. And then 2020 hit. This shows the death rates uh, across counties in the US as of the end of April. And as you can see, at that point in time, it was a very urban pandemic. It was an urban pandemic because the vacationers from Italy who brought the disease back came to New York first, and that's where it started to spread where people in the biotech industry brought it to Boston and that's where it spread, where party goers in New Orleans brought it down there and that's where it spread. You can also see a cluster, I think related to biotech as well, in Atlanta, right? Cities were the places in which uh, the disease spread and uh, people throughout the world who had the means, like the, the characters in Boccaccio's Decameron, fled the plague-ridden city to find some sort of escape in low density areas. Now, unlike cholera, right? Um, so this shows the relationship between population density and COVID cases as of May in, in the US. Um, unlike cholera, uh, in fact, there's no particular long-term safety in low density dwellings from COVID-19. And you can see that by the end of November, it's in fact the lower density parts of America which are gonna be more afflicted. Airborne contagion just is not, you know, you're not protected against it by just living at slightly lower densities. That doesn't work. Whereas, in fact, having your own sewer system, having your own, uh, having your own, own um, unconnected water system is, is a pretty good protection against cholera. And so by the end of November, it ended up being behavior rather than density that determined the spread of the disease. The connection between density, in particular informal density, uh, crowding, and COVID-19 is particularly striking in the developing world. This is work of mine with J.P. Chauvin and Stephanie Kesselman, which just shows the relationship between COVID cases, again, about May, and the share of the population living in a favela in an informal settlement in Brazil. Uh, again, more crowded living, more COVID in the early days. This is results from India. This is infections and uh, share of the population living in slums. The really remarkable work that Anup Malani and his co-authors have done has shown that by the end of July, more than 50% of the population in many Mumbai slums had been uh, exposed to COVID-19. So by the end of July, they had essentially reached something like herd immunity. And actually the death rates were relatively low. There are a couple of hypotheses for this. Slum dwellers tend to be young, they tend to be thin, and they may have been exposed to illnesses that were similar enough to COVID that it granted them some form of immunity. Now within the wealthy cities of the West, density is no predictor of COVID. This is a map of New York City, and I, I hope all of you can sort of envision that, that city in your mind's eye. Uh, this is Manhattan, and this down here is the downtown area, the great business districts, the, the highest rise residential areas. This is Brooklyn Heights. These are wealthy areas of Brooklyn. These are outlying lower density areas, uh, the Bronx, uh, outer Queens, and Staten Island. And you can see an interesting pattern here which is it's not as if the disease is, is centered in the high density parts of the city, it's centered in the low density parts of the city. It's, it's centered where uh, the people live with the most space around them, not where they're most crowded. And it reminds you that in fact, it's not as if living in a lower density area is any sort of a, a guarantee of, of safety. And it's not as if a high rise is intrinsically dangerous. The reason for this is quite simple. Luckily, thanks to SafeGraph, we have a remarkable amount of knowledge about people's mobility during the time of COVID. And this shows the decline in the share of people leaving their homes uh, by, from these across zip codes using these cell phone records. And as you can see in these high density areas, people moved much less. In the low density areas, people were much more likely to go out, go to work, move around. That's not because the people in downtown New York were smart or the people in Brooklyn Heights were smart. It's because they were rich. It's because they were rich and well-educated and they were able to telework or they were able to leave town entirely and go to some lower density locale. 
And this shows that, you know, this is from Couture, Dingle, and Hanbury's work. This shows the difference between mobility for well-educated and less educated people. This is in Philadelphia. And it shows you that, of course, before COVID hit, the well-off and the well-educated move around much more than the less educated. Uh, in, in some sense, the, the, you know, the better educated you are, the more nomadic you are in the modern world. After COVID, they were the ones who shut down most. A couple of other things to note here. Um, the big decline happens long before you have the regulatory shutdowns. The big decline happens here. The state of emergency does not carry any regulatory regulation with it. And it was often acted in the early days of the COVID as if governments had the option to either preserve the economy or preserve lives. In fact, they didn't have that option. Um, people stopped work, stopped moving around because of fear. And there was no way that you could, you could make them go out and spend again. A nice paper of this, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, shows that using bank data on Sweden and Denmark, that Sweden, which had sort of no, no significant lockdown, economic activity dropped by 25%, whereas Denmark, which had a quite hard lockdown, economic activity dropped by 29%. But of course, the other thing that I want you to notice is the difference in education here. Um, why is education so powerful? Why, why are changing trips so powerful? They're just a very good predictor of how many COVID cases you got. We estimate in our paper, this is joint with Caitlin Gorbach and Stephen Redding, that a 10% reduction in the number of trips is associated with a 20% reduction in the number of COVID cases during the early months in New York and five other large American cities. We estimate this not just using the actual change in trips, but using exogenous sources of variation, like the pre-COVID uh, industrial mix of different zip codes. And so, uh, what this shows is the change in the number of trips and the share of workers who are deemed to be in essential industries based on their industrial occupations. And as you can see, the, the fewer people were in essential industries, the larger the reduction in mobility. It's a big gap. And what are essential industries? People working as nurses, people working in grocery stores, people doing the basic things that we need to do, whereas management consultants or economics professors are certainly not considered to be essential by anybody. Um, by contrast, this is the share of workers who could telecommute, and as you can see, again, the more you can telecommute, the sharper reduction you, you have. Um, and so it's really about sort of industrial luck that determined which parts of the city were able to, to zoom to work and able to be safe. Now, in some sense, and the work of Matt Kahn and natural disasters reminds us of this, in some sense, the impact of a natural disaster always depends on the strength of the existing social institutions that it strikes. You know. Uh, Earthquakes in 2011 hit both uh, Haiti and Chile. The Chile earthquake is actually larger in magnitude and it kills a tiny fraction, less than 1% of the number of people who are killed in Haiti, right? That reflects the, the civil infrastructure as well as the physical infrastructure of Chile relative to Haiti. Um, the 19th century plagues or even the 14th century plague uh, that came to Europe didn't actually undermine existing social institutions because they were strong and they were built for defense. The, the sixth century plague that hit Justinian and the Byzantine comeback was so powerful because Justinian's future already teetered on the edge of a cliff. In 2001, uh, the, the terrorist attacks on New York and, and Washington DC ended up being shocks that the city more or less shrugged off because the city had had 20 years of comeback and the city was feeling united and successful. Sort of unimaginable to think right now of how much the nation even rallied around Rudy Giuliani on, on when he was on the cover of Time Magazine. Um, after 20 years, our cities feel far more fractious, feel far less uh, uh, at, as one. And I wanna highlight three failures of cities. Um, one of which is the cities are bringing productivity but not opportunity. Cities have always been places of inequality. It was Plato who wrote in the Republic that every city of whatever size is in reality two cities, one a city of the rich and the other the city of the poor. But that inequality, which in some sense reflects an urban strength, the fact that cities are attractive to both rich people and poor people, that inequality is tolerable only if cities are fulfilling the historic mission of turning poor children into rich adults. Sadly, they don't seem to be doing that today. And I'll show you some data on that using Raj Chetty, John Friedman and Nathan Hendren's Opportunity Atlas. Secondly, successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable. Uh, and that's in some sense America's housing failures. And we, that failure to build combines with the hollowing out of economic opportunity in the center of America to in some sense reflect a closing of the metropolitan frontier. It's in some sense, it's America's unemployment failure. And I think this means that COVID-19 strikes in America and strikes American cities in, at a place at a time in which they are far weaker than they were 20 years ago. 
So on the left, you see the relationship between population density and GDP per capita. Uh, these are bin these are bin scatter graphs uh, across America. On the right, you see upward mobility. What the mobility measure is, it's the it looks at a cohort of children born between 1978 and 83. It controls for parents' income and it asks what place in the income percentile do these children end up when they are adults. So this tells you that in the lowest density areas, they end up somewhere around the 45th percentile. In the highest density areas, they end up in the 39th percentile. That's really a huge difference. This is across metropolitan areas. And in one way of thinking about this is that if you come to an adult as a, come to a city as an adult, you live a relatively integrated life, even if you live in a poor neighborhood. You go to work, you travel on an integrated uh, train system, you work in, a, in probably a service industry with rich people and poor people around you, there's opportunity there. If you're a child growing up in an American city, you live in a block that's likely to be highly segregated, perhaps in a housing project, and you go to a school that is also completely isolated from the children of, of the wealthy or the children of the well-educated. Um, this shows within cities. So this is population density and upward mobility. Uh, again, a gap between sort of middle densities of, of about 45 percentile down to 38 percentile at the highest densities. And this shows the relationship between upward mobility and distance from the city center. Again, moving from about 38 to about 45. This shows the particular power of urban school districts in, in the US. This shows the break at the edge of the school district. So you can see a jump up from the 40th percentile to the 46th per, 42nd percentile right at the school's edge in track mobility. The other graph shows they can also look at your probability of being incarcerated as an adult. That drops down from close to 3% on the right inside to about 2% on the right on the outside. Whether or not this is selection or treatment is very hard to do, to tell, but there's certainly a strong association between whether or not you, you live within a central city school district and whether or not you end up being imprisoned as an adult. And this just shows uh, African-American upward mobility and segregation at the city level. One of the downsides of large cities is they, enable, they can form neighborhoods, enclaves, which create the possibility of tremendous amounts of segregation. The more segregated the city is, the worse off it is for upward mobility. And this is one of the reasons that I am uh, a critic of this you know, odd fad for 15 minute cities that has evolved during COVID. Right? Uh, the idea of limiting cities to small areas seems like a model for segregating and separating rich from poor, black from white, that will only make things worse for the children of poverty who already live in things that feel like isolated villages, even if they are within a great urban area. This is the second failure, the rise of housing prices over the past 20 years. It's been overwhelmingly in the most dense areas, not in lower density areas, that has slightly reversed itself during the past year. This shows the uh, rise in prices at the city center rather than the city's edge. Again, this reflects the demand for cities as a place uh, to, to live as well as a place to work. But it also means that the poor, it means that the upwardly mobile are priced out of cities that are, risk becoming boutique towns affordable only to the wealthy. And of course, all of this affordability is a choice. It's a choice that is made to restrict building. You can see along here, uh, along the horizontal axis is the amount of new building stock relative to the uh, initial size of the city. And along the y-axis is the gap between housing price and the marginal physical cost of construction. You can see that the places that build a lot aren't expensive and the places that are expensive don't build a lot. This tells you that it's supply. And I will tell you more than that because many of these cities are relatively low density like Los Angeles and San Diego. It's a choice not to build. It's a regulatory choice. And it's a regulatory choice that ensures that America's geographic disparities remain. Um, so before COVID, I was convinced that America's largest social problem was the rise of prime age male joblessness, which was 5% when I was born in 1967 and has been over 15% for most of the past decade. Uh, Prime age male joblessness is not spatially neutral. It is concentrated in particular areas above all in America's Eastern heartland, which is a relatively low education and a you know, poorly governed part of America that starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi, stretches up through Appalachia and ends in the Rust Belt cities of the North. In some of these areas, more than one in four prime age men are jobless. This joblessness is deeply persistent. This shows the relationship at the public use microsample area between the share of the population not working in 1980 and the share of the population not working in 2010. This correlation is over 80% and the coefficient is more than one, meaning that far from converging, it's exploding. It is related to things like opioid consumption. This is the, the prevalence of opioid consumption in America. 
It is worthwhile remembering that at least if you put any creed on happiness data, being jobless is much worse than being poor, at least in the US. So this shows the gulf between happiness, between living, between earning more than $50,000, uh, earning between 35 and 50 and earning less than 35. And as you can see, unhappiness creeps up, but then it bursts when you look at not working men. This is not true, by the way, for not working women. The happiness gulf is tiny with not working women, typically because not working women actually do things that leave them, that make them socially connected and give them a per sense of purpose. And those social connections and sense of purpose are really the, the wellsprings of most people's sense of identity and sense of, sense of uh, well-being. And you don't have that if you're a non-employed male. Um, Partially because what do unemployed men do? Uh, whereas if I showed you this data for women, you would see lots of lots of increases in caring for others, right? If they were uh, not working, how much extra? We'll just look at the Eastern Heartland. How much time do people in the Eastern Heartland, men in Eastern Heartland, spend when they go from working to not working? Nine minutes. Okay. So if you read a New York Times article about house husbands who are caring for their children, note that that's sort of one person. That basically that's that's not what happens with non-working men. What happens with non-working men is they watch five hours of television a day and play somewhat more computer games, and they're miserable. They are also overwhelmingly living with their parents, which is one reason why they're stuck in place. So in terms of the long-term not working, about thirty percent of not long-term non-working men are actually living with their parents. Right, and that's one of the reasons why they're geographically mobile is that their parents are not going to buy them an apartment in San Francisco, even if they don't mind if they live in their house in Kentucky. Now, this rise of joblessness gives us at least a reason to rethink or reopen place-based policies, which I generally have been fairly critical of. There are three plausible reasons for place-based policies. One of which is we have local externalities like agglomeration effects and human capital externalities, and things like big pushes. But we can't really measure the shape of these externalities, even if you believe, as I do, that they exist well enough to know if we want to move the skill into West Virginia or into Silicon Valley. Do we want to crowd the skill or uncrowd the skilled? The skilled are good wherever they go, but where do we get the biggest bang for the buck out of them? We don't really have credible estimates of that. Two, there is a case for insurance uh, and redistribution, which are really similar things. In 1967, a New York, uh, sorry, Boston and Detroit had the same incomes. Uh, 50 years later, Boston's income is 40% higher than Detroit's. Maybe we should have a national insurance policy. But if you do it based on current location, you're going to distort the migration decision or push up housing prices in the area. And anyway, in the US, states would be the natural, you know, element, and states explain less than 2% of income variation. So it's kind of a, a silly thing. Um, the third idea is different local conditions call for place-based targeting, right? So where housing supply is limited, right, you may want to subsidize housing construction. Uh, where housing demand is elastic, you may want to subsidize housing vouchers. Similarly, you may want to do more to, to uh, subsidize work in places where long-term joblessness is longer, is, is more severe. So I think there's a case for both reforming entitlement programs, which discourage work in uh, high joblessness areas like the Eastern Heartland, and targeting em employment subsidies like the earned income tax credit towards workers in that area. Now, the economy, economy in those areas as well, has proven remarkably vulnerable to the COVID pandemic. And if it were not for the trillions of dollars uh, that the federal government is shelving out sort of amazingly, uh, America's economy would be in much worse shape than it is. Uh, this is very different than pandemics in the past. So if you go back to 1350, to this second appearance of the Black Death, uh, that left Europe much richer because in a subsistence agriculture economy, the basic amount of wealth is determined by the land per capita. And killing off a third of the population means that the remaining population has 50% more land. Now, that accrues directly to the landowners who are not the poor peasants, but you have wages then going up for the poor peasants as landowners bid for them, and they bid particularly for skilled workers. Many historians have argued that in fact, that added wealth was part of the impetus for urbanization in the 15th century and the rise of luxury goods, particularly cloth that cities provided. In 1919, 18, 19, 19, um, we had moved to a manufacturing economy. Um, and while the factories themselves proved unsafe, the manufactured goods were not seen as being a source of threat. And so people would still buy cars, they would still buy um, machines when they were produced by factories, even if while well, the plague was going on. And so as Francois Veld of the Chicago Fed has shown, the 1918, 1919 pandemic was a short, sharp shock. It was a short recession, but it was over almost, you know, as soon as the disease was over. By contrast, over the past century, we have moved from a manufacturing economy to an urban service economy. 
32 million Americans have found work in the service industries of leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. These are the kind of jobs where the ability to serve a latte with a smile has been a safe haven from outsourcing and automation. Yet that job can vanish in a heartbeat when that smile turns into a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. This just shows the evolution of American work. Um, the blue line that starts at the top and ends at the bottom is manufacturing. Again, we still produce a great deal of manufacturing in the US, but we do it mechanically. We do it with machines and robots. By contrast, leisure and hospitality is the yellow line that crosses from the bottom into the third place. The blue line that's in the middle is retail trade. Those are the urban service jobs, one fifth of the active American workforce before the start of the pandemic. The top two lines are education and health services. That's the green line. Those are, uh, you know, at risk jobs, but they're by and large jobs that remained because they're backstopped by government payments. Um, the orange line is professional and business services. That's those of us who were able to zoom our way to survival. Um, at the start of the pandemic with a series of co-authors, we started looking at what happened to small businesses as a result of this, and the results looked absolutely catastrophic. 45% of all businesses had closed as of that date and huge gulfs between some industries like banking and finance were only 19% had closed to others like personal services or arts and entertainment were more than 70% of the businesses had closed. And people were expecting to be closed. 37% of the businesses expected to be closed in December. And that of course leads to the last section of this talk, which is will the boost in remote working become permanent? This shows safe graph and a decline if the share of people going to the workplace in five different countries, right? 40 years ago, Alvin Toffler wrote in the third wave that the rise of telecommuting technologies right, um, will actually cause us to, to leave the cities, leave the offices, uh, and return to cottage industries, to working at home. For 40 years, he was completely wrong. Now, all of a sudden, he, it looks like he was right. But is he right for the moment, or does this augur a more permanent change, a more larger switch to electronic interaction from human interaction? <laughs> In some sense, Toffler was just echoing the, the gigantic trends of his time. As we know, urbanization is shaped by a dance between centrifugal and centripetal technologies. The 19th century was an age of centripetal technologies like the streetcar and the skyscraper that brought people into cities. The 20th century, at least in the US in the middle decades was a centrifugal century dominated by radios and televisions um, and the move to the suburbs created by cars. Um, these changes killed off urban industry as uh, the New York's garment sector was the largest uh, urban uh, industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s. And it was slaughtered in a few short years by outsourcing and automation. And so it was natural for Toffler to think that these technologies would kill off the urban high-end service industries, the urban information industries. But of course, for 40 years, they didn't. For 40 years, we continue to cluster one another, with one another. And the reason for that is, is captured by these two pictures, which is the Wallace office at Bloomberg's uh, City Hall and the Googleplex, the Google campus. Um, and what you can see here is that what happened is that globalization and new technologies did something that Toffler didn't think about. They radically increased the returns to being smart. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. This Bloomberg Wallace City Hall is an echo of the Solomon Brothers trading floor where Michael Bloomberg began working. Um, the Solomon Brothers trading floor remained. JP Morgan Chase was quick to tell its traders it wanted people back on the trading floor. And the reason for that is that it's, um, there's no industry uh, in which, um, there's no industry in which, which knowing a little bit of inf extra information can make you richer faster than finance. If you think about it, there's no other industry which should make things easier, make things more successful than to do things long distance than Google. And yet Google didn't send all its workers home. It you know, brought them together, it connected to one another because it thought that creativity comes from connection, which is certainly what I've always found as well. Now going forward, right? Uh, what, will, what will this current thing mean? Is this, this comeback of the city over? There is some evidence that we are, you know, some jobs, particularly call center workers, which is where most of the work has been done because you can measure the productivity of call center workers. Uh, some jobs are just as productive, at least in the short run when they're done at home. This is from the work of Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington who are following work that Nick Bloom did, randomizing workers into a Chinese call center, in a Chinese call center into working at home and working uh, on site. They find that when there was a switch to working uh, remotely, the productivity of these workers uh, increased. But on the left hand, on the right hand side, you see something else. Look at these bottom lines. This is being promoted to a mid level job, which almost everyone does. But this is promotion to an upper level job. What is an upper level job for a call center worker? It's the ability to handle, it's jobs that handle more difficult calls. So to be, 
to be promoted, you either have to have learned the skills, you both need to have learned the skills to actually deal with difficult calls, and you need to have convinced your superior that you have those skills. That is just much easier to do on site when you're actually connected to each other, when you're listening to people around you, and when your boss can listen to you. And you see this idea of sort of cities as, as or physical workspaces, as places of learning here, as the promotions are just much higher for the on-site workers. Similarly, um, the works of Carlos Dabuin and Jose Ramon Moreira Saria shows that um, while firms are um, continuing to hire uh, workers who are, do uh, non-remote jobs, you know, this just shows non-remote jobs and remote jobs. Non-remote jobs had a bigger employment decline initially, and then they came back, both in employment and hirings. Remote jobs, employment stayed, st stayed constant, but hirings went down. So whereas Microsoft will tell you that its programmers are just as productive as they, as they were when they were live, actual new hirings, new postings for, for programmers in Burning Glass are down 40% between February and November. Um, even more amazingly, this teleworking phenomenon is incredibly unequal, right? As of uh, May, which is the height, 50 million Americans were teleworking, 50 million Americans have lost their jobs uh, from COVID. Um, but look over here, what share of Americans with a high school degree were or less were teleworking? 5.2% of those without any degree, 15.3% of those with a degree. Whereas 68% of people with an advanced degree were teleworking. If your vision of the future is a, work, is a vir virtual workplace, that's a future that is incredibly unequal because this virtual economy has just left out huge swaths of the world. We actually asked uh, business owners what share of the people who switched to remote do they expect will stay remote. We asked both our, our small firm sample and Alignable and the National Association of Business Economists. We got numbers like something like 40% of uh, firms thought that 40% or more of their workers who switched will stay switched. So that will be a substantial decline in the demand for urban real estate. And I think that that does have the ability to shape cities, but I just wanna make a couple of final points. Um, the if the shock doesn't end quickly, meaning that if the vaccines prove, prove vulnerable to variants, um, if we have another pandemic within the next five to 10 years, then I think this is really a, an existential threat for cities. If this ends quickly, okay, if the vaccines hold, if it doesn't happen again, if we are countries make the investments that they need to make sure that it doesn't happen again, then the shock is real, but it doesn't change urban life massively. Still, there'll be short-term shifts. Remember the nature of urban real estate markets mean that prices will drop more than vacancies will rise in rich cities, okay? So it's not like you're gonna see ghost towns. In places like New York and San Francisco and London and Paris, commercial real estate prices will drop, but the offices will still be occupied. Commercial space may be slightly more vulnerable than residential because as we know, after these months in lockdown, people are dying to connect with each other. They're dying to be with one another and that's what cities do. I think that cities will reallocate from the old to the young, both in terms of people and in terms of businesses, both because the young crave connection more and because they're less vulnerable to disease and because young businesses need the connection. In some sense, all of us who are in old businesses who have old relationships have been coasting on social capital built up over years or decades. And some work will move either to homes or lower density locales. Um, what will this mean for cities? So again, these so, show high commercial cost cities beforehand. These places you expect to see declining prices. These are low commercial costs. These are places that you could really see vacancies. And once you see vacancies, this spills over to other businesses because you don't have the demand for the ancillary businesses, for the, for the stores, for the restaurants that serve people coming to work. And so these are the areas where you really look out for those vacant towers. One way to think about this is that what the Zoom economy has done is it in no sense has eliminated the demand for face-to-face -face contact either in the workplace or in life, which means that city life is not vulnerable, but each individual city is because it has never been easier for a startup to relocate from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas, or a bank to move from New York to Miami. And this means that in some sense, competition is just heated up. This is dangerous because cities are in a progressive mode. And if you try to tax the rich, if you try to tax businesses within the US, they're just gonna move. And so I worry of a replay of what happened in the 1970s when New York tried to create a local welfare state by taxing the rich and they just moved out and they just vanished. I think it's incredibly important that we invest in institutions that actually protect us from the COVID next time. This requires a multinational effort. And my book very much emphasizes something that looks more like NATO than the UN, something which takes spends a large amount of money to make sure that we protect our cities. But finally, and I wanna end on this note, this has been a tough time for our urban world but cities have been through worse. Cities are amazingly resilient. They are, have been creating miracles since Socrates and Plato bickered on a Athenian street corner 2,400 years ago. And the age of urban miracles is not over. We will connect again in city streets. Our cities will rise again. Our cities will be places of opportunity again. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Glazer, for this wonderful presentation. And without, without further ado, I will pass to Professor Andrea Calagliu for his comments on Professor Glazer's presentation. Andrea. Thank you, Carlos. Let me share my PowerPoint. Okay. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Glazer for sending me the, the draft. I think we're not saying anything illegal here, right? That you send me the proofs of your book, which I read and, and thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, the book and the keynote that he delivered represents an ideal follow-up to his uh, 2011 book, The Triumph of the City, where, as you can imagine from the title, and I recommend reading the book, uh, it would share an optimistic view about the way urbanites presently benefit from living in cities, and that was also very well documented. I believe that the book and the keynote touched upon many interesting questions, all uh, tightly interconnected, and in fact suggest countless interesting research questions, just to name a few that would be of interest for the regional science community at large. Are cities based on the benefits that are due to physical and aspatial proximity going to die? That is probably the most important single question that we find in this book. How serious is the threat that is being posed by present and unfortunately likely to be happening again future pandemics? Will cities be able to revert to the pre-COVID lifestyle that they offered? And lastly, is technological change the main responsible for the unequal developments in Western economies? Well, will cities outlive the disastrous consequences of the presently ongoing pandemic? Factors such as business closes, closing, fear of social interaction, the enormous rises in public debt and the consequent reductions in the funds that will be made available for investing for future generations all lead us to perceive somehow worsening expectations about our future chances to live in cities. That is, I guess, uh, Professor Glazer can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one of the reasons why uh, he and, and uh, Professor Cutler wrote their book. I will now go through uh, each of these three arguments and see where my, my, my feelings are. The first is related to businesses going bankrupt. It's well documented in Ed's book. Uh, the book also draws a lot of um, uh, information from uh, prior research and recent research also uh, co-authored by, by Ed. The service economy suffers especially where low skilled jobs focusing on social interactions are concentrated. Uh, Bartik and co-authors uh, had included uh, in a uh, uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences 2020, April 2020 uh, paper, find that the layouts occur almost immediately, actually just a few weeks into the crisis, at least in a context of a lot of churning into uh, the, the job market. The risk of closure is negatively associated with the expected length of the crisis. Small businesses are extremely financially fragile. They actually hold just a couple of weeks of cash on hand, uh, which is actually pretty worrying because of course this crisis is lasting much longer. And then in the developed world, massive use of government sponsored relief uh, funds and programs is being undertaken. However, we do have prior experiences suggesting that at least in some cases, businesses tend to bounce back uh, to prior trends. There is a very nice paper, uh, it's a working paper as far as I can tell, uh, which actually shows similar uh, findings based on the 1918-1919 Spanish flu uh, experience. Forecasts, uh, Roberta Capello and myself just published a paper, if I may advertise this a tiny bit on the Journal of Regional Science, find that these uh, uh, forecasts can actually be rather optimistic and we do expect a lot of a substantial comeback from uh, initial losses, although these immediate costs are actually pretty spatially heterogeneous. And some uh, areas, this is based on the European Central of Regions, are going to suffer quite heavily. Second point relates to the fear of social interaction. And I honestly feel it myself, and I guess that many colleagues here connecting today are sharing the same experience when we go to work, when we shop, or we watch just younger people. Uh, simply hang out. That is a picture I found countless. That is my, my, my hometown here in Milan. This is the Navigli, the channels uh, crossing, the ancient channels crossing downtown Milan. This is a February 2021 uh, picture. It was on a press agency, uh, the ADN Kronos agency uh, website, and we can find countless of these pictures, uh, even uh, uh, just a couple of days old. Uh, 
Uh, the literature unfortunately tells us that the trust uh, levels decreases seem to be persistent over time and, there, and therefore I think that much work on this front should be done. Also, as also argued in, in uh, Ed's keynote, to get prepared for possible future events, uh, let's say in the same lines, along the same lines as the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Third issue, rises in public debt. We witness enormous rises in public debt, and I can tell you because I hail from a country where public debt is an institution itself, and, uh, and they are mostly due to the activation of relief funds. So these are data for selected OECD countries. These are OECD data from selected OECD countries running from 1995 to 2020 included for a bunch of uh, OECD countries, including Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Spain, UK, and the US. And as you can see, apart from the, the virtuous Germany, we are all uh, um, uh, spending a lot of money in relief funds. And of course, without uh, sound um, economic performance, this is actually translated one-to-one -one into public debt. In the short run, this is actually good. It, it was in a way inevitable, right? Because some people were exposed to the economic risks associated to the pandemic without any fault whatsoever. If you waited on tables, uh, you just, uh, you know, risked to, to lose your job and you actually lost it in many cases just because of something that was uh, totally exogenous to the, the way you worked or, or the way your firm was managed. However, in the future, that may create a problem. So I think we have actually um, uh, uh, two major choices here. One is to apply partial haircuts, meaning that the addition of the extra debt that we accumulated over the past few months could be partially renegotiated. But of course, we have vast evidence that this bears negative consequences in terms of institutional and individual investors' confidence. Or alternatively, we would try or mean we may try and uh, enhance uh, uh, economic policies aiming at stimulating growth so that basically the numerator of the, uh, sorry, the denominator of the uh, debt to GDP ratio actually increases faster than that. So to conclude, then does the future of cities look so gloomy? Well, markets certainly seem not to think so. Almost in every developed economy, housing prices are constantly increasing even over the past couple of quarters even in real terms and after um, seasonally adjusting data. This is a selected sample of US cities, Abilene in Texas, Eugene Springfield in Oregon, Des Moines in Iowa and Fargo in North Dakota. Uh, data are organized uh, uh, taking the first quarter of 2020 housing prices index as a standard benchmark. And as you can see, each of those cities has, has actually gained in real terms in terms of real estate prices. If you think this is because it's small towns and people just relocated seeking, uh, you know, uh, in less dense uh, locales, uh, some type of shelter from the risk of exposure to the pandemic. The same, although to a lesser extent, applies to larger urban uh, areas, including Boston, Massachusetts, Washington, District of Columbia, Chicago, Illinois, and Los Angeles, California. This is also uh, a, a global housing prices index from The Economist. Uh, the, the two lines uh, in blue represent uh, uh, the world as a whole, and in uh, light blue, we have the US. And as you can see, we actually have rising trends in real housing prices, taking the first quarter of 2020 again as a benchmark. Again, uh, aggregate data actually suggests that housing prices are increasing. So to conclude, the fact that prior events have been successfully dealt with in the, in the immediate past does not or should not automatically lead us to believe that the future looks so bright. For instance, while Rome successfully went through several major crises, starting an empire that lasted roughly 1,000 years, eventually it fell exactly to external threats and internal weaknesses. This is also mentioned in Ed's book. And its population fell from roughly 1 million people, the first city to pass this threshold around the 100 years uh, Christ era, to about 30,000 only 900 years later. By the same token, while Athens acted long as a lighthouse for Western civilization, it did suffer from the 430 before Christ epidemic of plague, what in the uh, words of Thucydides was called the Deloimos ton Atzenon, sorry for uh, my uh, Greek pronunciation to Greek colleagues. In his history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides writes that the catastrophe was so, so overwhelming that men 
not knowing what would happen next to them, became indifferent to every rule or religion or law. So what should we expect now? Glazer's book ends with an encouraging message, a future with more hope than fear. That is not just wishful thinking. Uh, both the authors are well aware the cities face unprecedented challenges and they come with quite some proposals that I'm briefly mentioning here. Also, some of them were touched upon by, by Yad's presentation and NATO for Health. So basically uh, an international organization heavily funded and ready to intervene whenever risks of similar pandemics will break out better plans and institutions for preventing pandemics at all national, local, and international levels, promoting investment in long-run costly public programs, for instance, educating people and getting them ready for facing similar challenges, reducing cities' vulnerability to similar threats, reforming criminal justice, which is, of course, uh, uh, high on uh, each of our country's agenda. With much left to do and a lot of complicated issues to deal with, I tend to agree with the bottom line of that speech. The future of cities does look complicated, but at the same time, it does look right, especially if we all make a joint effort to keep improving their efficiency, which is the very reason why they exist, their livability and their equity. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'll pass. The, the screen to Professor Glaser to his comments and his final remarks. And uh, Professor Glaser, I'm sure you saw the in the chat three questions that you might be willing to comment on, please. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, let me just thank Andreu for his very kind comments and also his very substantive comments. I mean, I think I think uh, really excellent discussions add significantly to the information content, and I think Andreu has just has just done done uh, done that. Um, and I think we are largely in agreement on things. And I, I think it's also true that. Um, in some sense, much more than my previous book, which was summing up uh, 20 years of research. Uh, Andrea is right that the new book is very much looking forward and trying to uh, you know, set questions for uh, that I think are interesting going forward. Um, the book is very directly public policy oriented. So there are you know, things about, there's a whole chapter on why the American health system, for example, costs so bloody much and has done so little to protect us against the pandemic. The answers to that question, which my co-author David Cutler is largely responsible for supplying, are interesting, one hopes, to Europeans. I mean, there are lessons there in the sense that America's federal government sees itself as being both in the health sphere and in so many other spheres as a cash pass through rather than as an entity that actually takes responsibility for things. So our public health system, Medicare and Medicaid, pays for health insurance. It doesn't actually take responsibility for the health of the nation. Unlike, for example, the National Health Service in the UK or public health uh, agencies everywhere, that ends up producing a lot of weakness at the center. But uh, whereas I really tried my, my previous book to make it a, a book about the world, this one also attempts to be about the world, but it is, it is somewhat more American in terms of this. And you know, the dysfunction of American policing, American prisons, and American schools are sort of you know, unique among wealthy, uh, we wealthy nations. And we have to write about those as well, since there's no way to understand the sort of weakness of American cities without going into those institutional details. But uh, the good news about that is that, of course, all, you know, health systems failed in many countries other than the US. Uh, education is underperforming in many countries other than the US. And uh, even policing is underperforming in other areas other than the US. So there's plenty of work to be done on, on these topics. And I think a, a rich international dialogue is really vital. So I have tried to uh, answer some of the questions in the chat, but let me just bring them up here. So uh, I'll just say what people get, people said, and I, I urge you to ask more questions as we as I do that. Um, so uh, Artem, oh gosh, uh, Korzenovich, uh, which I'm sure that I butchered that name, uh, asked, does your analysis mean that the exploding rents in major cities is rather a state failure and not a market failure? So less regulation is a solution and not more regulation like failed rent ceiling in Berlin. I certainly believe that, although it is true that if, you know, what, what the market can do is close the gulf between the cost of construction and the current selling price or the current renting price. Okay, so if you allow an unfettered free market, as for example, New York more or less had in the early de decades of the 20th century, uh, where the city built 100,000 units a year during the early 1920s, you have prices for tenements largely that are really uh, quite close and make it make it make financial sense to build. 
you will not actually provide housing for the very poor with that, right? Because in fact, we need housing to be cheaper than that. So I, I do want to emphasize that while I think housing is largely a self-inflicted, you know, the housing costs are largely a self-inflicted pain that, that uh, uh, rich cities have done to themselves, for taking care of the very poor, you may need to do more. Also in the US, I am very comfortable you know, basically taking an almost unalloyed uh, pro-building, pro-deregulation uh, view of housing markets. I would not say that is universally true of, of uh, you know, European cities. I mean, at an extreme, you can take Bruges, right, saved from change by the silting of the Zwin in the 15th century, which is now a, a perfect jewel of a, of a, of a city. Uh, no one thinks it makes sense to tear down, you know, 15th century dwellings in Bruges and tear, put up high rises. And so the question is, what parts of London fit in the category of, of easy to change and what parts of, of uh, London do not? Or Paris or Milan, for that, that matter. Although I will just say architecturally, I love cases in which you have old buildings and new buildings close to each other where you can have a dialogue between great architects of the present and great architects of the past. Um, uh, Sabaya, uh, Sabia Sachi Treparthi asks, cities are for rich or poor, rich, or, rich people are poor. What is the percentage of benefits from a city to, for poor and rich differ? Uh, what is the chance that poor becomes rich over time in the city or rich remains rich over time? So um, that's part of what that upward mobility data that I was showing is about. That shows you that at least in America, you have much less upward mobility in central cities than you do outside of central cities. So this means that poor children are not turning into rich adults. Uh, this was different for adults, let's say a generation ago. So when I started first working on uh, my paper, Cities and Skills, which I wrote the first draft of in 1994, that very much found a lot of upward mobility for poor people who come, came to cities, much faster wage growth. Um, that has tended to fall over time in the US. Um, and the connection between urban density and um, income has largely disappeared for less skilled. Um, that from a from the Eli lecture of David Otter. Um, although Otter's paper is slightly misleading, because what's happened is the, that the impact of city skills on earnings has gone way up. And if you look at just less skilled people living in more skilled cities, they actually do quite well. There still is an urban density premium in places like New York and San Francisco and so forth. It's that you know lots of dense cities are places like Detroit and Cleveland and there is no urban wage premium there. There was 50 years ago when they were industrial powerhouses. Um, last question, why a NATO for health? Although the WHO is not perfect, it is still efficiency small box. Okay, that's from an anonymous person. Okay, so that's that's great. You give me a chance to say something about this. Um, so the WHO is not a bad organization. I'm not in any sense, we are not arguing that the WHO should be shut down, but it is just not remotely commensurate for the needs of this. And so the problems that we particularly highlight in uh, the WHO is its political sensitivity its lack of a small number of countries which take responsibility for it, a, a lack of really sufficient resourcing. Um, and so NATO was a different model. It was a much more funded model and a much clearer mission. And it was largely mission driven, not political. Um, and those are the attributes that we see as, as needing to happen. We need to spend you know, many billions of dollars to engage in pandemic preparedness. We need an early warning system. We need a, a willingness to lock down travel on a dime. And we need an ability to investigate the starts of pandemics. The WHO has been blocked in all of these things. They stopped, you know, they, they were very slow to declare a pandemic risk in Africa during the Ebola outbreak. And they were very, you know, in January and February, they were very discouraging of shutdowns and travel to China saying that we know these things don't work. Um, the problem with our shutdowns, the problem with our lockdowns is, uh, the, is that they were applied too late. And that's, of course, a story of quarantines over and over again. But we also need to do things like invest in preemptive vaccine development. We need to do, engage in preemptive vaccine uh, testing. We need to actually, in short, take this battle as seriously as we did uh, the battle uh, against, against uh, Stalin. And just one final thing, I think it's Again, if there's a lesson from this, it is that a plague that starts anywhere can kill anywhere. And in some sense, it reminds us, and that should be the central lesson of this in a sense, that we are all connected with each other. And it is you know, crucial for the cities of the rich world, the citizens of the rich world, to understand that there is a high return from investing in the hygienic infrastructure in sewers in the poor world, to make sure that we don't develop antibiotic resistant superbugs, which then spread uh, across the world. And I think finally, I wanna, I wanna end by noting, you know, one of the things that was really the crucial errors that America made during this was reopening in states like uh, Florida and Texas without testing the asymptomatic. 
Whereas the, the brilliance of New Zealand, Zealand strategy was they had a hard lockdown, but they continued to test the asymptomatic and they didn't reopen until they knew it was safe. In our book, we call that the humility to learn. And I think for all of us, as we go about in scientists, we must remember that we don't know all the answers, that I actually don't know how to fix schooling in America, but we have a, a way of approaching this, which is to experiment, to learn, and to evaluate, ideally using randomized controlled trials, but using all of the tools that are at, at our disposal. And I hope going forward, as we face this you know, enormous threat to our urban world, we remember the importance of scholarship and we remember the importance of not prejudging the answers. So thank you for letting me into your lives this morning. Thank you for including me in this discussion. And uh, thank you, Andrea, for your very kind and very thoughtful discussion. Thank, thank you. you, Professor Glazer, for this brilliant uh, talk, and to Andrea for his interesting comments, and also for the participants. And uh, we are already already uh, ahead of time, and uh, we need to move forward because we have sections starting in seven minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for all. See you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ed.